button. Hey everyone, we're gonna get started here in just a minute. I've got Lisa on the line um, and she is gonna be ready to go here in just a minute. Lisa, I'm sorry, I cut you off midstream and accidentally pressed the start button. So we'll get going here in a minute. Thanks everybody for your patience. <laughs> Okay, well, welcome everyone. Today is the 18th of June. It's one o'clock on the East Coast. My name is Paul Merrill. I'm from Beaufort Fairmont Test Automation. We focus on test automation, DevOps, and solving several problems. How do you sync up development and testing on in, in your, your environments? How do you sync those up? How do you shift left? And then how do you get automation started, whether it's regression testing or something else? We do that through three different services. Number one is consulting. Number two is training. So if you need help with open source tools or methodologies or things of that nature, we're happy to help. And finally, we have dedicated experts that can embed with your team and make sure that you are ready to go and that you're moving forward with test automation. So when you're ready for that, give us a yell. You've got our information. Today, I am thrilled. <laughs> I'm so excited to have Lisa on. I've got her on mute right now. She's probably laughing. Um, she, she's uh, just a... A wonderful person. She's been so good to me over the years. Um, when I was getting started as, as a uh, business owner in this industry and is getting both for Fairmont going, I would post more blogs. I would I would do webinars and all those kinds of things. And she would always retweet or help me out in some way. She would come and comment on our blog on my blog posts, and uh, that was just an awesome thing. So I'm really appreciative of that from her. And then to have her here on this is uh, really, really exciting as well. So as a bunch of you know, there are a couple things here. Number one, we're gonna have about five minutes of businessy stuff to get down. Then we're gonna get into Lisa's presentation about why and how to engage your team in testing. And finally, we will have the gift card giveaway, the Amazon gift card giveaway. It's a $50 Amazon gift card just because you stayed and you were here. It's an awesome deal. So. Let's get started. I always like to say thank you. This is the B list. If you're not familiar, the B from Beaufort Fairmont is on the list. That's what makes it. So if you see a name that looks like yours, it's probably you if we've talked recently. Thank you very much for whatever it is you did or just for being you, that's why you're on the list. So excited to have you on there and uh, congratulations for making the list. Hopefully you see your name. So a couple things here. Number one, I've got a role that I'm trying to fill here in Raleigh. I've actually got several of them, the same role. And we're looking for test automation engineers. I've got this posted out on the website. If you go to BeauftFairmont.com and you look at careers, I believe it's about us and careers, you can find this in there, or you can look for test, tester and Gherkin script creator on the website. Should be pretty easy to find. I'm really looking for mostly entry level folks. So if you haven't been in testing, if you haven't done automation, but you're skilled in analytical thinking, you're logical, you like technology, you're good at it. Um, if you're early in your career, if you are changing careers, I've even met people who were in completely different careers. For instance, um, substitute teachers who came in and, and did this. And really what we're just, we're looking for here is analytical people, people who can think really strongly, people who adopt technology very quickly, people who have very good communication skills and uphold our major values, which are honesty, integrity, having healthy relationships, and then finally, 
uh, being respectful to ourselves and others. So those are the main things for us. It's a pretty good opportunity. I'm really looking for people in the Raleigh or Triangle area. So give me a yell. If you're one of those people, if you know someone, let them know and send them my way. Upcoming. So I had a, a chance, I was invited over to do a webinar for STPCon. I'm gonna do one that I've never done before, brand new. I hope I get a chance to write it before then, we'll see. Five simple ways, five ways to simplify your test automation scripts. So uh, I have a downloadable piece of content on the website for this. You can search on the Beaufort Fairmont website for five ways and you ought to be able to find it. In fact, it places pretty highly in the Google um, listings as well if you wanna just look on Google for it. But download that if you want a little preview of what we're going to talk about. But these are the ways to simplify our test automation scripts. Um, this, is a, this is a big part of why we're successful at Beaufort Fairmont and why our clients are successful is following these five ways. The 23rd of July, Andy's coming back, Andy Knight. If you don't know the Automation Panda, you should. Go look up the automationpanda.com. That's his blog site. Andy is fun to talk to, fun to listen to, fun to be around. Um, he is uh, He's just a great guy. And he did a talk on BDD for us a while back. And it was so good, people asked for more. I knew they would, so we're excited to have him back. Finally, CAST is coming up. And I wanna to talk to you about CAST. So CAST is the Conference for the Association of Software Testing. I've got a discount code right here. Beaufort Fairmont, without the quotes, is 10% off. So if you wanna go down and see us at Cocoa Beach, please do that, go sign up. I've got some information here. If you wanna sign up right now, or get the link, go ahead and scan that QR code on iPhones. You can just use your camera and it'll automatically take you to that link. You can go and sign up or bookmark it for when you get your boss's approval or whatever. Lisa and myself are both gonna be down there. Some really wonderful speakers. I know Angie Jones is gonna be down there. I believe um, just a number of them. When I looked at it, I was just blown away by the number of great speakers that are gonna be there. It's gonna be a wonderful time. We are thrilled as a company to be able to support conferences like this that help move testing forward. We love testing and software. We love it when it's done well, especially. So these are great opportunities to get better at your craft, to learn more about what you do, and, uh, and to meet some wonderful people as well. So make sure to join us there. Last chance here before I click over, scan that QR code. Five, four, three, two, one. Awesome, okay. That's not a slide. So don't forget, stick around for the $50 Amazon gift card giveaway at the end of this, and we will uh, we'll get going with that. So I'm gonna take Lisa off of mute here. Hi, Lisa. Hey, Paul, thank you for all your kind words, and thank you for supporting CAST. That's one of my absolute favorite conferences, and we do have a really exciting lineup this year, including a keynote with Charity Majors, who's one of my heroes with all her, all her observability work. So I can't wait. I can't wait. I, yeah, you know, I got to tell you, I don't even know what observability means. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> um, no, you know, I, I appreciate everything you've done for me and for the testing community. If you guys don't know, I'm going to read you a little bit about Lisa, but she is a very strong mind, a strong contributor to the testing community. And as far as CAST goes, look, I've always heard great things about CAST. I'm really interested in figuring out what the yellow card versus the red card <laughs> thing is. This seems like something special to CAST, um, but uh, it's my first time at CAST. We're thrilled as a company to be able to sponsor it and to be one of the few sponsors there. That's, that's gonna be awesome to get that much attention from you guys and get to know some people. So, so Lisa. Lisa Chrisman is the co-author with Janet Gregory of More Agile Testing, Learning Journeys for the Whole Team from 2014. Also, Agile Testing, a Practical Guide for Testers and Agile Teams from 2009. The Live Sessions, Agile Testing Essentials Video Course and Agile Testing for the Whole Team, a three-day training course offered through the Agile Testing Fellowship. Make sure to look that up, Agile Testing Fellowship. Lisa was voted by her peers as the most influential Agile Testing professional person at Agile Testing Days in 2012. She's a testing advocate working at Mabel, to explore leading practices and testing in the software community, please visit lisacrispin.com and agiletester.ca for more. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, Paul. It's so exciting to be here. Me too. I'm excited to have you. I'm going to make you the presenter and we'll get going. Okay. Um, one, I guess one thing before we start, I would like to do a couple of polls just to see who people are, if you're okay with that. So, 
first question, folks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send this out, launch a poll here. And the question is, I can't see the question here. Oh, do you struggle to get your team involved in test automation or in, in testing? So Lisa, I thought this might be helpful for you to know kind of who we're speaking yeah, with. Yeah, that's great. So they're voting now. I try to get like 70% or so, we're at about 50. Let's see. Let's see how we do. All right, that's, that's enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close down the poll and I'm gonna share the results. So it looks like, hopefully you guys can see that, 37% yes, 41% sometimes, and 22% no. So, so basically 78% have some struggle with this. Cool. So that's, that's good to know. All right. Well, I'm going to leave you to it. Thank you so much for being here and good luck. Uh, just be patient. I'm going to try to figure out which is the right thing to share. <laughs> here we go. All right. Do y'all see the right thing? I, I don't yet, but one second. Uh, Sorry for the technical difficulties. Oh, this happens. Uh, it's, it happens. It's okay. Let's Let try me know. this. Let's try main screen. No. Uh, let's try screen two. There we go. Third time's the charm. You're seeing my right. slide I'm, now? I'm not seeing it yet. Guys, we practiced this. I promise. I promise we practiced. Um, let me see. I may have a missing window here. Oh, here we go. Yes, I do see it. Thank you, Lisa. Sorry to bother you. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So thank you for that great introduction, Paul. Let's talk about why and how to engage your whole team in test automation. If my PowerPoint will. So Paul already did a great job of introducing me, and uh, I'll just uh, introduce you to my donkeys, Marcella, Ernest, and Chester. They occupy a lot of my free time um, in here in beautiful Vermont. So please do feel free to get in touch with me anytime on Twitter or at my email. Um, always happy to talk to people and hear about your journeys with test automation and all kinds of testing. So what I'd like to talk about today is, um, let's see, is why we want to get our whole team involved with testing and test automation and why that works. And, and then how can we go about doing that? And I'm gonna share some examples from my own experience as well as some tools and models that I find help enable collaboration. So whether you're currently in an agile environment working on a cross-functional team or if you're working in more traditional setting with a with separate test team, um, there are ways that you can collaborate with people in other roles for automation success. So we so we had that poll. So it sounds like a lot of you don't feel like you're quite successful with automated regression tests yet. And you, the problem is if you're not if you don't have good coverage from automated regression tests, it might affect your confidence in being able to deploy changes to production, especially if you're trying to do that more frequently. So a lot of teams, a lot of agile teams are doing it every couple of weeks, and then teams moving towards continuous delivery might be doing it once a week or, or twice a week or multiple times a day. So how do you get the confidence to do that? One big piece of that is automated regression tests. So why do we need automated tests? Um, Ashley Hunsberger has a great metaphor for test automation. Uh, she says that you don't absolutely have to have automated tests, even to do continuous delivery, but it's like driving at night without your headlights. You can certainly do that, but it's a lot less risky if you can turn on the lights. So test automation helps us turn on those headlights so we can see where we're going and get the fast feedback that we need. And it also makes us more time, if we're not doing manual regression testing, we have more time to do more value-add activities like exploratory testing, um, other forms of testing like accessibility, security, you name it, uh, or even to automate, do a more automation. So uh, it, we can proceed and make changes more fearlessly if we have that safety net. 
test automation is just hard. Whenever I have to start a new automation effort, it, it is scary. And now we have a lot of really wonderful automation tools today, and they do make writing automated tests really easy. But writing tests that are reliable, that you can trust when they fail, you know there is a defect, uh, that are easy to maintain, that's another story. That requires a lot of thought, and it requires a lot of skill. And how do we make sure we have the test coverage we need, and how do we keep up with the frequently releases I was talking about? If you haven't read this book, Accelerate, I highly recommend it. Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and Gene Kim. Uh, it's based on the science of the last several years of the State of DevOps survey. And DevOps is, you know, testing is at the heart of DevOps, despite it not being in the name. And um, in this, there's a lot of information in here about test automation and how it affects team success. And so one of the predictors of high performing teams according to this scientific data, is reliable automated tests. And these tests are created and maintained by developers in collaboration with testers. So they also, so we need developers, we also need testers, and also the testers should be doing manual activities like exploratory testing, acceptance testing, and more. So this shows that a team effort towards automation is really a key to success. Another interesting thing in, in the State of DevOps survey results for 2018 is that they found that when low-performing teams start adding automation, it does help them. It, it lets them deliver uh, more frequently to production. Their cycle time is lower. It lets them respond to production failures more quickly. They have fewer problems in production. But then as they add automation, all of a sudden, they're also adding complexity. They're probably trying to uh, build their deployment pipelines. They start accumulating technical debt. They don't go into a lot of detail in the survey about why this is, but my suspicion is they start spending a lot of time maintaining tests or investigating test failures. And they end up doing a lot of manual things to, to try to get their deploy pipelines going because it's not all automated yet. And it really, it really can bring you down. So, this is something to keep in mind. If you start your automation effort and suddenly things get harder, don't be surprised. It's going to require a big push to, to keep moving forward and get to that high-performing team where our customers are happy, our team is enjoying its work, and everything's good. So this whole team responsibility for quality and testing, Janet, Gregory, and I have been talking about this for many years now, and we've seen lots and lots of teams succeeding with this. So the team deciding what level of quality they want to achieve and deliver to their customers. And part of achieving that level of quality is getting those fast feedback loops with automated tests, as well as designing our code to make it easy to test, which in my experience results in just generally more reliable and robust and maintainable production code as well as test code. And I think one reason for this success is if we get everybody on the team, testers, developers, analysts, DBAs, product owners, designers, operations experts, all those different people have different experience, different skill sets, different, hopefully different unconscious biases, you know, so that we can all all work together to see the problems and to collaborate to, to solve those problems more quickly. Now, when I say test automation, in the context of this presentation, I'm talking more about regression test automation, but um, there's a lot more to test automation. So we also have, obviously, load testing, performance testing. Um, you might automate to set up data for your manual exploratory testing or to get your application in a certain state for manual exploratory testing. Uh, we have to deploy to test environments. So there's a lot of infrastructure involved there. Chaos engineering, that's a form of exploratory testing in production. And despite the name, it requires careful setup to see how your system responds to really drastic production problems. So I want you to think for a minute, what's the one biggest problem that your team faces with test automation? Maybe you have a lot of automated tests, but you're spending too much time diagnosing test failures or 
maintaining your test because your application is changing a lot, um, or or maybe you haven't been able to get traction on test automation at all. <clears throat> and there's no shame in that. It's it's hard to get started. So, um, but what is holding you back? Now, when I ask people this in 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 person workshops, uh, I guess we could have done a poll for this, but I didn't think about it. Is you know. Fear, as I talked about, it's scary. Uh, our application is changing really fast, especially for UI testing. We don't have the time and money to invest in learning to do automation, learning to use a tool, learning to uh, refactor our code so that it's more testable. Brian Merrick, uh, years ago, came up with this hump of pain. And this is true in any automation effort, whether it's trying to do test-driven development where we guide our development with technology facing unit level tests or whether it's higher levels of test acceptance test automation or whatever it is. At first, it's just more work. You're having to do extra work. You're having to learn how to use new tools. Um, you, you, just, you just get more and more work and, and you don't have a lot of automated tests yet, so there's not a lot of benefit. But at some point, you kind of cross over the hump and you do have, uh, a library of reusable components for your test. You start to know what you're doing. It starts to become easier and pretty soon you really are saving time because of your automated tests and you can put that saved time towards other things. But that hump of pain is really hard and a lot of teams just never get over that hump. And so what's the best way to attack this? Obviously there are lots of different ways to go. I do know I do know plenty of organizations that have dedicated uh, test automation teams or test automation you know, software delivery engineers and tests, whatever title. And, and those people do exist, but they can be really hard to find. So in my experience, the delivery team, we have the people that we need. You know, I know we don't all live in, in unicorn land, but we still have a lot of people with, with different skill sets. And um, we can figure it out together. So developers are good at writing code. They can write reliable, maintainable test code, and they can make the production code easier to deal with from an automation perspective, such as putting unique elements, or putting unique IDs on user interface elements so that your UI test can interact with them. And conversely, testers are really good at specifying really good test cases. So what if we work together? This is a, a really great synergy. And if you're not on a cross-functional team right now, you can still build bridges to your development team and other teams that can help you. I worked for years on waterfall teams and I, I just made friends and, and collaborated. So we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. Um, I have to say though, um, if, if, a, if the test automation is all being done by testers and if the developers are doing no unit level test automation, in most contexts, in the long run, I've seen that is not sustainable. The team just accumulates too much technical debt. The testers are always dealing with unit level bugs and can't really get beyond testing the, at the unit level. So that's a problem. Work together. Oh, my slides keep on cooperating. I'm gonna talk about just a few examples from the teams that I have worked on. And here, here are some pictures of my teams. They're wonderful people. So, I started on a team back in oh, 2003 where we didn't have any test automation at all. And we had a legacy code base. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So how do we get started? And, and actually regression testing hadn't been a problem because the team had not released anything in a really long time. So, um, so what, we, what I did was to go and talk to the business stakeholders. It's a financial services app, so there's a lot of risk there. So I said, well, you know what absolutely has to work? Um, and I made this prioritized list and then I wrote manual regression checklists for all those capabilities that absolutely had to work. And then the day before release, so we were doing scrum and two week sprints. So the day before, or a couple days before release day, everybody on the team, product owner, developer, DBAs, analysts, every, everybody helped with manual. We just split up those checklists and we all did it together. And so then everybody felt the pain and it was really motivating for everybody to start thinking, how can we make our code more testable? You need management support to do that, but I highly recommend it. I've, I've actually done that on four different teams. 
And then where do we automate first? You know, we got unit level tests, we've got API te tests through the API, tests through the user interface. Now we know there's a lot of data to, to, to support this, that unit level tests give us the most return for the effort that we put into them. And they're the fastest. They're the tests that everybody loves to write and loves to run because we learn right away if we've broken anything. But it takes time to learn how to write unit tests too. Um, and while the developers learn difficult things like test-driven development, I found a good approach is, well, this manual regression testing, that takes a lot of time for the whole team. So what if we automate some smoke tests through the user interface or the API, if we can, to cover these major areas and the manual automated um, regression checklists? So we chose a tool everybody on the team, including developers, were comfortable with because anybody might have to look whenever there's a failure in the continuous integration and uh, and fix you know fix the test or fix the problem with the code. And we used good practices, kept the test very simple, mostly happy path tests, and they were surprisingly effective. We were we were able to replace all the manual regression testing with with those, so that we had time to spend on learning to test at the unit and API level. So that's one approach you can use. Now, I mentioned we had legacy code, and it was just really hard to work with to automate anything at all. So there's two approaches you can use. One is the rescuing approach. Uh, Michael Feathers has a great book on working effectively with legacy code. So you just work, you just chip away at that code. You refactor it bit by bit as you develop new features and fix bugs and make it amenable to automating tests. So that's one, one approach that works. And another is the strangler pattern. Uh, you can read about this in Martin Fowler's blog, um, named after the strangler fig tree that grows on top of other trees. Um, so we will develop all our new features in a new architecture that's layered and it's easy to write automated tests for. And over time, we'll just replace all that old code. My team chose the Strangler approach, but both of those approaches can work. And then whenever we had our planning meetings, we asked questions like, how will we automate tests for this feature or this user story? And it got everybody thinking right away about testability and automation and, oh, you know, we could automate all the tests at the unit level and that will be the best thing because those are the fast tests that, that we love to write. Um, or, you know, we this is something that's critical. We need to be sure that everything from the user interface down to the server and the database and to maybe an external system that those are all working together properly. So we do need to do that through the user interface. So this, have these discussions early before you've even written any code. It can make a difference. Like a lot of times uh, on this financial services app, the developers will say, well, you know what? This is easier to do with testing in a tabular format, which we can do with our mid-layer API level uh, test tool. So we're gonna do test-driven development, but we're gonna use that rather than unit tests. So really good ideas come out of these discussions. We also made a decision to use acceptance test-driven development so that we get concrete examples of behavior from our product owner and other business stakeholders, turn those into executable tests, automate them as we were doing the coding. And so not only did we have automated regression tests, but we also had a really good shared understanding of each feature across the whole team. So that's a whole nother webinar talking about how to guide development with tests, but that's something to consider. And it's, I think it's important to choose tools that promote collaboration. So there are lots of tools out there and lots of frameworks so that people who don't write code uh, and don't, for whatever reason, don't want to write code or learn to write code, they can still specify tests, do what they're best at. And people who are coders can write the necessary automation code. And even even the tools that, you know, a lot of these that are so-called scriptless testing tools, yeah, they're scriptless testing tools if you don't want to write any code. But if you can write code, you can really add some value to those tests as well. So um, working together is the way to go. And my teams over the years have found we, you really have to try those tools out in a real situation and we would have bake-offs so for a sprint we'd identify two test tools we want to try out and actually automate all the tests for each story in that sprint 
in both tools to see which which one worked better. And if neither one of them worked, then we do another round with different tools. That's a big investment of time, but I, I'm telling you the tests that those original smoke tests I wrote for that team back in 2004, some of those tests are still running. Uh, so this is a big investment and you wanna make sure that you get the tool that fits your context. Another good thing to do is to, to, to stop, especially if you don't have any automation yet or you're not happy with your coverage, take a step back, look at your system as a whole and identify the high risk areas. So uh, my last team, we were trying to move to continuous delivery. We wanted to deploy twice a week and our tests were just too slow for that. So we were trying to decide, should we rewrite all our tests? How can we improve them? And getting a, a cross-functional group of people in a room to draw the system architecture at a high level and start looking at what were the riskiest areas were super helpful because then we could go back and see what tests do we have now to cover that can we improve those tests can we write some new tests what will help us so that that's a way to guide writing new tests or or upgrading the tests that you have and as you write these tests get them into your continuous integration so even as soon as you have one automated test, create a test suite, run it in your continuous integration so that each time somebody commits a change to your code, the test will run and give you feedback. Uh, it's really motivating. It starts putting the infrastructure in place so the next person can do it more easily. So uh, don't be running them on your local machine. Run them in your, what well, you can, but also run them in your continuous integration. And make your, if you have a problem, I find that the first step in solving a problem is making it visible. And the same with making, with your progress, you wanna encourage the team as well. So how, how are you coming along? Make it visible so that you can stay on track and make corrections if you need to. Um, on my last team, we had the big wall monitor so that when our deployment pipeline failed, it was really obvious, but what happened was everybody was pair programming and nobody looked up at the monitor. And so sometimes an hour would go by before anyone noticed it failed. And when you're trying to get a release out that day, that's a problem. So we got together and brainstormed, how, how can we make actionable alerts? Uh, and we actually ended up getting a flashing police light and hooking it up to our uh, production deploy build and when it failed, the light would start flashing. That got everybody's attention and it wouldn't stop flashing until somebody took the responsibility to say, I will investigate this failure and make sure it gets fixed. So um, sometimes you have to be really drastic about that. You don't wanna keep doing that forever, but when you need to change your habits, you might need drastic actions. So, so this team, like I say, we were trying to move to continuous delivery and, and do a better job with our automated tests, we had thousands and thousands of automated tests, but they were hard to maintain and a lot of them were flaky. Um, so we started, decided to ob adopt a page object pattern or approach for our UI tests. There are a lot of other good patterns like the screenplay, screenplay approach. Um, we started refactoring the old tests to eliminate duplication. There was a lot of, of copy paste going on over the years and we wanted to apply the do not repeat yourself principle or don't repeat yourself principle. Um, we decided to move from imperative tests where the test says, okay, click on the username field, type in Joe user, click on the password field, type in password one, click the submit button, uh, you know, to log in. Instead of that, you just have a test that says, you know, log in as user Joe test and verify successful login so that behind the scenes, you're clicking the buttons and typing the text. But the test that you look at just says what the test does and what it's trying to check for. And that way, if you change, you know, maybe now we're logging in by typing on a keyboard, maybe tomorrow we're gonna log in with our voice. So the test doesn't have to change, just the mechanics behind it do have to change. But um, it makes that test less brittle. And then we also did a lot of pairing testers and developers working together to improve our test coverage. Because like I said, testers are really good at specifying tests. So those are some of the experiments that, that uh, 
te teams I was on have done. And I, I learned about small experiments from Linda Rising. It's really important to identify the biggest problem you have and set a goal around it. So, you know, maybe you're having regression failures in a particular part of your application and it's really causing a problem for customer support and taking a lot of developer time. So maybe you have a hypothesis of, well, we believe that automating tests at the API level for this part of the app will reduce regression failures by 10% in one month and, and, and try that and see if it does. If it doesn't achieve your goal, then try a different experiment. If it does achieve your goal, you can maybe move on to another problem. So small experiments with the whole team participating. And again, if you're not all on a cross-functional team, at least collaborating with people on other teams to do this. So let me just talk about a few of the visual models and tools that can help with getting traction on test automation. And these are thinking tools, or it's a tool, not a rule. So these are just things to help you get started talking with each other and having these important conversations about automation. So some of you may be familiar with the test automation pyramid from Mike Cohn originally, and there are a lot of really great variations on that now. Um, Recently, Richard Bradshaw started talking about putting testable production code as part of that. This is very important. So, you know, we have the fast tests that developers love at the bottom and the slower tests that we still love at the middle layers. And then sometimes we've got to test more of the application and that just has to be done. So have conversations. Where do you want to automate tests? Where, where does, for each test that you need to do, what level, what level does it belong in? Uh, how can you make your code more testable? What's your strategy? Where are you going to start? So talk about that. Um, this is a model from Rob Meany, and it's, he calls it risk mapping. And I think it's a wonderful model. I have not used it, this particular model in real life, although I've used a lot of these concepts. I, I find it has a lot in common with the agile testing quadrants that Janet and I use. but. Um, it's basically using risk to guide our testing and automation. And what Rob says is the core thing for him is that the test approach is driven by risk. And each of these tests, each of these types of tests answers a specific question. So for example, for regression tests, the question it's answering is, does our existing functionality still work? So having the team talk about these different types of tests and what question it answers and what your team needs to do in terms of automating or doing those tests is really valuable. Um, I really like his operability section. So I, I mentioned observability early on when I talked about Charity Majors speaking at CAST. And um, this observability is part of oper operability, but it's all testing. We're just looking at production use, looking at patterns, seeing what might be unexpected, seeing what we might need to change based on actual usage. So that's another form of exploratory testing. So I'll, I would I would recommend trying a model like this, again, just to generate conversations and help guide where you want to go. And this isn't all about automation, obviously. We have, we have a whole section on humans. Um, so I just feel like this is a really, really good tool to help guide your team. Now this is a test suite canvas from Ashley Hunsberger. I have a link to it in my resources slide at the end and I'll, I'll share my slides. Um, this is a, a way to go through and look at your existing automated test suites or, or perhaps the ones you need to still create and ask a bunch of questions about each one of those test suites and this is really important because you notice the first thing is why are we doing this what's the purpose what again what questions are these tests answering but there's so many other things we need to think about uh, in regard to our tests for example are there dependencies that we need to make sure are in place um, do we have test data that's always a challenging one how do we get the right test data that looks like production and is realistic enough? Um, I, the engagement and failure response is important because like I said, our, our team had to resort to using a police light to, to respond to failures. But you know, we need to know who's responsible for looking at test failures 
How should this be handled? So there are a lot of questions to ask, and and this is just a great way to for your team to get together and talk about your existing tests or talk about the tests that you want and what needs to be in place for those tests to be effective. And again, all the different people on your team or on the different teams you're working with can contribute their expertise, like for data, we have database experts that could help us. For pipeline and execution, maybe we have operations specialists who can help us. So we can build relationships with those people. So speaking of building relationships, how do we get the whole team engaged? Well, test automation is part of a quality culture, and we know it's hard to change a culture. And there's a lot of basics. Um, the book Accelerate goes into this a lot about how do you get to be a high performing team. And we know from a lot of studies that Google and others have done that psychological safety is a prerequisite to being able to have innovation and be a successful team. Trust is obviously really important. Uh, when we're talking about our automated tests, we need to be able to feel safe to raise issues of, you know, I don't think that this test uh, is being effective. And I think we need to add these other automated tests or whatever suggestion you have, you need to feel be able to feel free to talk about it. We also need to invest time to learn and to experiment. And this is a real investment. It's just like saving money. It's compound interest. If you, if you and your team spend an hour a day learning, within a very short amount of time, you're going to be outpacing every other team because you're going to know so much. And you have to focus on quality. If you focus on speed, you're going to cut too many corners. You're going to accumulate technical debt. You're going to say, oh, well, let's put off automating those tests till next iteration because we really need to get this feature out. Uh, it's, just, it's just a slippery slope. But if you focus on quality, and I have lived, I have lived this, eventually your team gets so much domain expertise, it has such a great safety net of regression test that you're not afraid to make changes. You have the domain knowledge to cut features down to the bare bones that the company really needs, and you can go faster in the long run. Martin Fowler has a really good blog post on this that came out last month, and I have a link to that in my slides as well. So I talked a lot about building relationships. Um, this is, if you read Katrina Clokey's book, a Practical Guide to Testing and DevOps, she's got really great insights on how to build relationships with people in other teams and in other roles. You get to know those people, who, who can help you? One of the superpowers of testers I find is we know how to get the right people together to talk about a problem, talk about a question. So whether you're on a cross-functional team or you have separate teams, uh, get to know these people. Ask for help. You know, you can make friends by asking for help. It's just a human thing. Ask a developer to come explain the high-level system architecture to the test team. Um, ask an operations specialist to explain how to use a continuous integration tool. And then offer help. Say, hey, we're going we're gonna to have pizza for lunch and, exp and teach you how to do exploratory testing or teach you how to do accessibility testing. So, we can all help each other, and that builds trust and so that we can learn more. So our real goal is, is building that level of quality in that our team is committed to delivering, and test automation is a part of that. And testing in general, Elizabeth Henderson said years ago, that testing isn't a phase. It's an integral part of software development, along with coding, along with design, along with everything else. It's all part of one thing, and it's a team sport. We need everybody involved. And testers bring a unique perspective, and we can bring our testing skills that we can act as test coaches. If, you, if you're familiar with modern testing, the modern testing principles, a lot of that is about helping everybody on the team learn testing skills so that we can all build quality in and prevent bugs rather than focus on finding them after the fact. So that's really important. Um, and if we have a diversity of roles and, and skill sets, people with different experience involved, we're going to have a lot more success at solving our automation problems and providing those fast feedback loops that are automated regression tests provide and also the other all the other advantages of all the different other kinds of automation that we need for infrastructure for performance testing for testing all kinds of different quality attributes 
we can expand our automation to include all those things. Um, and so just the something that's not going to happen overnight, uh, that's the team I talked about that we started back in 2004 with no automation, took about eight months to get traction on unit testing and also to get those automated smoke tests. But you know, within a couple of years, we really, we really had the automation support we needed to, to go on and become a high performing team. So it takes time, but it happens. So we have some resources here. And again, like I say, I'll, I'll share my slides so that you can all find this. The uh, modeling your test automation strategy, I go through a lot of those different visual models. I only showed a couple of them in this presentation, but there are lots of different models you can use. Um, and then, you know, just it's really important to have a good basic for test automation. I really like Angie Jones's Test Automation U course, which is, which is free. Uh, and just some other articles and books that I think will help you. And then finally, the Test Automation Patterns Wiki from Dorothy Graham and Soretta Gamba. They also have a really great book on that, uh, A Journey Through Test Automation Patterns, which I should have put on here, but you can find it on this Test Automation Patterns. Art. These patterns are super helpful in creating maintainable tests that run fast enough and give you the feedback that you need. So it's, and, and even will help you with things like diagnosing test failures. I highly recommend looking at that. So that's all I have because I wanted to leave times for questions or anybody else's um, story that they would like to share about their test automation. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You know what? I, I reached back here and grabbed a book that you just mentioned, the one by um, Dorothy and Soretta. So folks, if you haven't read this, this is a fun one to read too. The, you know, while people are writing their questions, and this is something I forgot to mention earlier, usually it takes a little bit of time because most people want to type their questions when there are 140 people on, on the webinar or whatever, <laughs> instead of speaking in front of others. So as they're typing in their questions, I noticed several things. So one of the things is I see so much eye to eye with you on a, on a lot of a lot of things. There are some places where we differ, which I want people to know about too, because they hear my voice enough, right? Um, on, on this particular webinar, they hear your voice a lot more in general probably. But, um, but one of the things that's interesting to me is we mention the same authors and the same people again and again and again and again. Um, Martin Fowler, Michael Feathers, all these folks, Kent Beck, I'm sure Ward Cunningham, okay. all those folks, you 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 know who we're talking those about. Those people guided me early on. I can never think I'm enough. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I'm sure you've had the chance to meet these folks and and talk to them and whatever. They're just heroes of mine. <laughs> I haven't gotten the chance to meet them yet. But um, you know, I've noticed with people who are successful with this and so many other places in life, they read and they don't just read blogs. You you must set aside time for reading. Is that right? Well, you know, I. Audiobooks are a great boon to me because I can I can also listen to books. the The audio version of Accelerate, read by Nicole herself, is really amazing. And I was actually driving down the highway to Boston when I was listening to it. And when I got to the test automation section, I almost had to pull off the road because it was so exciting. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, you know. But of course, like everybody else, my stack of books to read is still growing. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I had that problem where you just read too fast. You can just get through too many books too quickly. But yeah, audible.com has been terrific for me to get more into my head. We do have a few questions here. Um, There's one early on by Claudia. She says, how do you break the belief developers have um, of being able to code and now also doing the testing? Therefore, no testers are needed on the team. I think she's saying, hey, if developers are testing and they're doing the code, why do we need testers? And that's that's pretty tough, and you know it's something I've experienced a lot myself. Um, and a lot of times, all you can you know, if you have the chance to go and work with them, and you can show them yourself what you do. Uh, a lot of times, I find the developers once they learn about exploratory testing and start to see the kind of problems you find with exploratory testing that you're not going to find with automation because automation doesn't really find new problems. Um, they're pretty impressed. And so if nothing else, I want you around for that. And, you know, again, things like accessibility testing that's so important today, security, we can automate some of that testing. We can't automate all of it. Um, you know, usability testing, our designers can help with that too. It's, it, but it is really hard. It's a cultural thing. Uh, and, you know, as much as I want the developers to, to own the automation, also my experience, and I have a lot of experience working with developers who automated all the tests all the way up through the UI and everything, 
by themselves and they're proud of that you know what their automation coverage sucks they tend to they tend to not put any assertions. I'm like, well, so what are you testing here that you got to this page and the system hasn't crashed yet? You're not even sure what page you're on because you didn't assert what you're on. Um, you know, they just, it's not their area of expertise. And so they, they just have a more shallow understanding of the testing side of it, even though they can do the coding side. So, uh, you know, I, I rely on things like uh, Linda Rising and Mary Lynn Mann's patterns for change and more fearless change to try to see what I can do to influence people um, and get them to try new things. Ex trying things as an experiment is one way to sell it. Like, oh, well, let's just try this thing for two weeks. Let me try pairing with you for two weeks. Or let me try pairing with you one day a week for a month and see how that goes. That's great advice. I have a couple of comments or questions here. Uh, I think you asked for comments as well. This is from, uh, I hope I'm saying it right, Meek or, or Mike. Mika? La may maybe so, Mika, yeah. Um, it says, thanks, Lisa, my two pins. Two things that helped me a lot with my team. One, asking for help. Uh, devs like helping out. That's a great entry to getting them involved. And number two, do pull requests for the test code. The devs will, oh. be, need, will be needed to review and get involved in the code. That's a great idea. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, I like that one. So let's see what else is here. Maybe a couple couple more as we're closing, closing in on time. Um, get your questions in if you haven't, haven't done it yet. Um, and it's really hard for me to scan ahead. I can't really do two things at once you're trying to scan ahead. I'm always trying to be careful what I read out loud. Um, is very, now I've told people that, so they're gonna hack it anyway. Um, it is very common that teams start with UI automation and it's really frustrating when the value is less than the cost to get it done. How can be recovered the trust in automation, how to change the mindset? Hmm, that's interesting. So. So they feel like the, they've lost trust in the automation because the tests were flawed in some way. Um, and the, yeah. It sounds like they're, they're seeing a commonality. I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like they're seeing some, something in common between UI tests uh, and the frustration of creating UI tests versus the value um, in creating UI tests. <laughs> I, again, I guess I have to, I would personally just approach it as an experiment and say, what's our biggest problem? We don't even trust our tests anymore. We're not even sure it's worth having them. Uh, well, let's try an experiment. Let's, you know, what do we think might improve them? Maybe if we tried a page object pattern or a screenplay pattern, I'm not sure if those are patterns, but anyway, if we tried a different way to design our UI tests, let's try that for a month and see if our tests are more reliable when we do that. Um, Great advice. Here's one by Charles. So Charles says, how do you test the tests? Um, how do we make sure that they will find defect X? Well, what, that's an interesting question because I would like to minimize how much I have to test my tests. And you know, back in the 90s when we had these vendor tools that had their own proprietary scripting languages, they had all this conditional logic and, and I had these tests with all these if then else, blah, 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 nested nested conditionals. And you know what, you have to test those tests because those are really complicated programs. Uh, and really you should even test drive them. Uh, uh, Brian Merrick's book, Everyday Scripting with Ruby, teaches you how to write Ruby by test driving your tests. Uh, it's just like, oh, that's terrible. But I used the automation tool back at the, the turn of the century uh, called Canoe Web Test and it was, it was used XML, so there was no logic because there's that's not a programming language. <laughs> um, and you just specify the test in, a, in, in XML, and at first I thought, well, that's not going to work. But it looked simple, and I needed something quick to do those smoke tests. So I did it, and it was just like, I mean, over the years, just those tests that were very straightforward and simple, they provided the protection that we needed in, a lot, in most cases. And so try to avoid getting too complicated. Um, but as far as testing your test, then you just simply have to be able to like introduce a bug into the code and make sure the test catches it or change the test somewhat so that you can easily cause the bug and then, and then feel good about, about it. But keep it simple. This is where those test automation patterns really help you. I like it. I like it a lot. So, um, we are going to, um, I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen now.
<laughs> we're going to do this drawing. I appreciate so much you being on here today and sharing with us your experience. Um, I think I have to get the pres presenter back from you somehow. Oh, sorry. Uh, there, we there we go. I'm going to have okay. it here in just a second. Thank you. And let's see what, what it shows. Hopefully it shows uh, what I want it to. There we go. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for being on here. I know some other folks had questions here and we'll try to get back to you with some answers on that. Um, I had a couple more polls here before we go. I guess uh, just one more poll and then we're gonna do this um, this drawing. And this is, hey, look, we're I'm running a business here. I asked some businessy questions. Don't get mad at me. You got a free webinar today, okay, with Lisa <laughs> Crispin. So um, I know sometimes some things are businessy, but if you'd like to talk to us about where you are with test automation and where you're going with DevOps, this is what we do. I love this world. I love working with folks who are trying to crack this nut. Uh, we've done it a lot of different times with a lot of different companies. We found success with it. We have some approaches that can work and can't. Uh, we can help you around some corners. If you can't see around the corners yet, we've been there, done that. We'd love to help your team. So I just wanted to pull very quickly on that. I'll close the poll now. Thank you so much. And I'll get back in touch with those folks who said yes. It's also a way for you to say no, right? To say no, I don't, <laughs> don't want to hear from you. Don't sell to me. Leave me alone, Paul. Um, so let's do it. Who's going to win this gift card, Lisa? Do you have any ideas? have any ideas not Let's a clue see. it's going to be claudia c claudia thank you so much for being here today there was no other one with the name claudia c so if that's your name you are the winner and i will contact you through the email you used for getting on this webinar with that 50 dollars gift card you'll get it from amazon i love being able to do that for folks it's fun to win something i love having a little bit of credit in my amazon account i don't know how you are lisa but i love that <laughs> So uh, I'll spend it right away on another book for my two read stack <laughs> <laughs> or more with $50, you might be able to get three or four books. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Lisa, I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being oh, here as too. well. Thank I look you. forward to seeing you at cast everyone. Cocoa beach. Don't forget Beaufort Fairmont as a 10% code off for your registration there. Call me with your test automation challenges. I'd love to talk to them to you about them figure out what we can do to help. If I can do that for free in a quick conversation, I love doing that. So thank you so much for being here and you all have a very nice day. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you.